Hello and welcome to the session one of the MOSA Virtual Summit, leveraging MOSA for C5 ISR electronic warfare and radar applications. My name is Dan Taylor, technology editor with the Military Embedded Systems, the Social SOSA Special Edition, and the FACE Special Edition. I'm also moderator for today's event. To learn more about Military Embedded Systems, please visit militaryembedded.com and check out our articles, blogs, and podcasts on military technology. Our speakers are Ken Grove, Director of Embedded Computing Architectures at Elma Electronic, Dinesh Jane, Senior Product Manager at Abaco Systems, and John Breitenbach, Director of a and Markets for Real-Time Innovations. Session one is sponsored by Elma Electronic, Abaco Systems, and Real-Time Innovations. The Mosa Virtual Summit is hosted by Military Embedded Systems Online and Open Systems Media. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. This and all Open Systems Media virtual events are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way without the express written consent of Open Systems Media. The session will consume about 40 to 45 minutes, leaving the remaining time for the question and answer session. Now let me show you around your viewing console. You'll find on the right-hand side an area where you can enter your questions in real time. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the session while the question is still fresh in your mind. We'll address as many questions as we can during the closing Q&A portion. If you have a question for a specific speaker, please note so at the beginning of your question, or I will offer the question to all our speakers. If you have a question pertaining to the event operation itself, one of our technicians will get back to you during the session. Please note that as much as we'd like to, we may not be able to get to all of your questions today. In that case, someone may get back to you after the event with more information. Across the way, on the left-hand side, there's a resources section, and that's where you can find the slides being presented today. Below that, you can view today's speaker information. I've got two more console features to share. Your console is customizable insofar as you're able to manipulate all of these widgets, Q&A, resources, and presenters for, for your ideal viewing experience. Expand them to get a closer look or close them to have the presentation window automatically resized around them. For maximum screen size, close them all and or utilize the full screen control in the upper right hand corner of the presentation window. To bring them back, simply click on the buttons in the bottom middle dock. We also have closed captioning capabilities in nearly a dozen languages. To enable this functionality, simply click on CC in the upper right hand corner of the presentation window and select your language of choice from the drop down menu. This session and the event will be archived online at the same URL you use to join today's live session and will be available within 48 hours. Once up, it will be available for, for, for at least one year. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Ken Grobe and Dinesh Jane to get us started. Thank you. So again, my name is Ken Grobe. I'm with Elmo Electronic Inc. I'm Director of Embedded Technologies. We're pleased to be at the MOSA Summit today and to address the topic of leveraging MOSA for C5 ISR electronic warfare and radar applications. The slide we have up uh, here is really an introduction that's setting the tone for the discussion where we're pointing to um, the description of a capability under the MOSA umbrella. And MOSA was defined um, by the government to um, drive the capabilities in a more effective way to be developed. And it was guided by the tri-service memo that's referenced here. And for today's purpose, it really references four standards, SOSA, the umbrella standard, CMOS, MORA, and VICTORY. So the discussion topics we'll cover today include application problems and challenges, addressing the MOSA application environment, so the environment that we're uh, describing under the tenets of MOSA, a brief MOSA overview, hardware elements, and sort of what the benefits are of MOSA readiness, and then a summary. So moving on to this slide, challenges driving open standards. If one looks at the right, we see a picture 
of a, inside of a vehicle, which could represent a vehicle that's fielded today. And if we look at some of these bullets, I'm not gonna read them all. Um, we're describing what the challenges are. They're actually driving MOSA and SOSA, if you will, need to innovate to address threats, modernize hardware and in the, at the commercial pace, operate within swap constraints, which you can see there's only so much room in the vehicle, and to maintain a fiscally efficient approach. So one of the things that we're challenged with here is complexity. And if one looks at the cabling, the cabling's not very neat, it's sort of messy. And the, the environment that, that's represented isn't, isn't necessarily intuitive. If we look at how the, how the industry or how the, the DOD has arrived where they are, we see uh, challenges that stem from legacy application of systems where we have legacy developed systems and stovepipes. And when you look at this system on the right, it's quite dense and it becomes, um, in a sense, a cognitive load for the crew to be able to utilize this system because of the complexity. And if you look at how many knobs and buttons there are, there's actually potentially duplication of systems in this, in, in this environment where we're really not leveraging the space that's in the environment in the vehicle uh, to the best degree possible. So, the, the big goal here of MOSA, and in this case, when you look at a system that's this complex, is, and you'll see a single pane of glass in this application, is make these systems easier to use and more effective relative to the overall implementation of new, new capabilities. Hey, Dinesh, do you have anything else that you could you point out about this, uh, about the, the images here or the, any other comments? Looks like spaghetti to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a spaghetti thing. So maybe we could do better. So we'll move on and take a look at the next stuff. Yep. So turning this back over to you, um, most uh, overview and objectives. Do you want to cover these? Yeah, th thanks, Ken. Uh, my name is uh, Dinesh Jen. I'm a product manager with Abaco Systems. So uh, MOSA's goal is really to solve the challenges that uh, Ken just outlined. Uh, the first thing and first and fundamental thing is to define a set of standards that everyone is committed to following, and that is that is key. MOSA leans heavily on Vita, uh, Vita specifications, which itself leans heavily on industry standards. Um, standardization is key for enabling platforms to be modularized and for these modules to be interoperable uh, between different solution providers. So you're not locked in to, to any one vendor. One of the key benefits is uh, platform reuse as the mission evolves. Uh, for example, we can add capabilities. Uh, there's a lot of talk about AI, ML, uh, machine learning, and uh, that could potentially be added to an existing platform uh, and used for a different mission. Uh, as we all know, continuous advances in silicon are critical for maximizing performance and swap. Uh, the CHIPS Act, is fueling major investments in new technologies, such as advanced packaging. And modularization allows programs to take advantage of these new advancements as they become available. Solution providers can provide reference designs at the module level, allowing quicker program starts. Uh, in addition, it's a lot easier to test, validate, and debug a system at the module level, as opposed to on a monolithic system. All of these benefits add up to reducing costs and extending the life of the program. So as an example of a MOSA design, this is a pretty popular uh, graphic um, that I borrowed. <laughs> um, so as we can see, uh, we can refer to the CMOS architecture. It's overlaid on a ground vehicle uh, and, and Really what we wanna look at is the buses. Uh, the standardization of the buses is key to the modular approach in implementing a MOSA architecture. As we can see, the system is decomposed into different modules based on the stated function. 
and connected together through these standardized buses, such as Mora Low Latency Bus and Victory Data Bus. If architected carefully, each function can be updated as program requirements evolve without having a major impact on the overall system. As an example, we could change out the R frequency bands on an SDR and upgrade that along uh, with the Victory Shared Processing Unit with minimal impact on the APNT unit. In the case of radar, we can decompose the processing chain into signal resources, uh, basically RF management and processing resources. We can then break it down further into its respective submodules. The modules and submodules are connected together through a low latency network architecture. The different MOSA submodules can then be selected and upgraded from different suppliers, providing optimal performance and flexibility. So when mapping this to a physical implementation, starting from the right of the diagram, the single board computer controls the system with application software and overall system control. The FPGA is a dedicated low latency front end doing ADC DAC conversion and direct RF sampling. The FPGA connects to the sensors. The hardware components support Victory and more software for interoperability at the logical layer for domain specific performance. But at the physical layer, they're using industry standard ethernet. If data is to be shared across multiple modules, a network switch with Mora and Victory services can be used to scale the system. So if we were to look at this as actual modules, the, these three modules here are also so aligned. Um, the module on the left is a is a um, FPGA DSP processor for low latency processing. Uh, in this particular case, this actually has a built-in uh, ADC and DAC uh, to maximize uh, swap. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the SBC, um, the SBC 3513. Uh, that will contain the application layer and control the system, and multiple SBCs can be used. In addition, the other one, the... Um, DSP, there can be multiple modules, uh, depending on the uh, the platform and the and the mission. Uh, and it, as we need to scale the system, if additional uh, buses are needed, um, a, a switch, uh, the SWE 450 s can be used uh, to connect different modules together um, to, to scale the system. So that's some pretty interesting stuff, Dinesh. All that brand new hardware that's working up at uh, up to 100 gig. So when we look at this um, with our partner Abaco, we've got all these great hardware elements. We've got RF socks, we have iOS BCs, and then we have these nifty network switches that are capable of operating up to 100 gig. So 1, 10, 25 per lane, and all the way up to 100 to support 100 gig ethernet, so four times 25. So when that's moved towards the packaging or the way that we're gonna connect all this together, this slide's just addressing chassis, backplane, and IO. So a few points about this, connecting and processing and signal distribution, how do we go about that? So if you look down in the right-hand corner, we got a little blue block, and there we have a couple of different chassis. These are development chassis at Elma. We call these compact frames. And they've been designed to take reference development backplanes that are useful in stitching together um, systems that are SOSA aligned, um, also in this case, CMOS aligned, to implement a particular capability. So the idea with the compact frame is to make it easy for folks to plug in their picks, their actual physical cards, the three UVPX cards that are so cell aligned, and be able to do some real work. So with the hardware elements that Dinesh just went over, we'd be popping those things into their respective slots that are mapped by the backplane that's above the compact frames. So in that backplane, if we work it from one side to the other, we've got uh, an iOS BC slot, a payload slot, and then a timing slot or a PNT slot where we plug a timing card if the system required it. 
a network switch slot, and then we have a, a two additional payload slots. So these give us the slot references to take cards that at the ICD level are aligned to the slot profiles and we'll receive them and all the, all the IO in this case, and this is the beauty of CMOS and SOSA, will align and we can plug and play with those cards and those slots. As we take a look at some other elements of this, what the backplane does is it receives the switch that provides ethernet centric connectivity on the control planes and the data planes, which is very typical and intended in a CMOS system. Further, it implements something called the IP and B buses on the bottom, um, which interface to an IPMC on the PIC that allows us to implement a chassis management scheme within the architecture. So one other thing that's of interest is on the top, we have these gray boxes and these gray boxes represent apertures that can take 67.3 connectors and allow us to have a way to get IO, in this case, RF in and out of the PIC um, in a defined way. So all of this sort of comes together where we have partners that can interact, in this case, Abaco and Elma, and make it relatively straightforward for the users <laughs> to be able to plug those cards into a known alignment in a slot defined by a slot profile and have that work. Further, as you look at the development cadence where you're doing this, one is getting from the development on the bench to the deployment architecture. And in this case, the deployment chassis architecture is actually informed by the CMF reference architecture. And this is an example of a CMF reference chassis that's being designed by Elma that will be aligned with the CMFF RA and then enable folks to do testing and integration in an actual deployment chassis. So moving along, this diagram is pointing towards the chassis management component of the architecture, where we're showing the IPMB and the IPMB buses, then there's two for redundancy. And that's at the bottom. And this comes out of um, the SOSA specification as it's been flowed into VITA. And what we're seeing here is the control plane architecture to the switch, and then the notion of a system manager off off to the right. Now, where the control plane relates to the Victory data bus, that's in a place where we refer to that as messaging. And in SOSA, this would be described as messaging interconnect. So this is for communications to um, guide the system, to interact with other system picks at the hardware level or within SOSA modules at the SOSA level to do communication. And then one thing that needs to be done is there may be a system manager out there that's connected to this box that's interacting with it and potentially giving it command or getting status from it and things like that. And this is relatively, it's actually well-defined within the SOSA specification today. One other point is that where Victory interfaces with the control plane is in something called the VDB. So Victory is a standard that defines how to do messaging and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's quite extensive document for communicating between SOSA hardware elements or SOSA modules at the, in, at the module level. And in this area, this is where we're showing um, how that uh, particular hardware mapping is taking place when you relate to architecture and then to the backplane. So I think we just advanced. So the, the next point would be chassis backplane and IO and how all this comes together. On the right, we have slot profiles and the slot profile basically defines the description 
of the IO. It's like the ICD for the slot. And these are standardized and they've been around for a while. Um, they're specified within SOSA and CMOS. And then uh, over on the other side of that, they're conveyed into VPX so that they can be accessible to the develop or well, actually to the um, development community, to industry. So when we look at the slots, what do we have here? We've got the IO intensive slot. That's the first one. We have a primary payload slot, which we have three of. And then we have a timing slot or the PNT slot, which is in the middle. And then to the right of that with the gold and the green, we have a network switch slot. So these slots are all connected together through the to the network switch where connectivity in CMOS is largely done through ethernet connectivity in the data plane in one domain and in another, another domain, it's done through the control plane. So if we look at how those slots map into the back plane, those slot profiles associate with a physical slot in the back plane and describe how it's, how it's wired. So this just becomes a mapping of the, the slot profile to the back plane slot, pro, back plane slot itself. And below it, what we're showing is an actual backplane. And those colors are actually showing uh, the type of slot and the physical backplane. So you go from these logical co concept or physical actual descriptions of the slot profile, then the mapping of those profiles into a backplane in an order. And then we come down below that and show the reference implementation in an actual backplane in that green block at the bottom. And I'll just move it. So with all that said, now what we've looked at is some of the logical description of MOSA. As we move through this, then describing the RF processing chain, Dinesh was describing architecture that would be used in an EW system. And then we need to bring this all together to do integrating, processing, signaling, and distribution. So what do we have now? Now we have open standard standards um, that include SOSA aligned VPX cards covering RF, the RF processing chain, VPX chassis that house the VPX cards. In this case, they're a special type of VPX card. They're a SOSA aligned or CMOS aligned VPX card. And then SOSA, that's called a PIC. And then we have a backplane that enables the card connectivity, card, card connectivity. So we'll turn this back over to Nanesh and he's going to describe something about this cognitive EW with GPG views. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. So we've we've gone through the presentation going through a lot of architecture and importance of standardization uh, for most of systems i wanted to share an example a real world example of of mosa in action so as i had described before we had uh, three modules we had the uh, vp431 which is the rf front end fpga low latency processing we had the sbc uh, and we had the switch and so that was that's been around for a while, and it's been deployed. Um, and recently, there's been a lot of chatter about uh, AI and ML and how that can be uh, implemented in programs. And we've actually gone through uh, a development, and we've created a white paper around it where we've been able to insert a GPU to allow for AI ML at the edge while still maintaining the same architecture that was designed prior to this new capability uh, coming online. So this is something that I invite you all to download. The link is uh, there on our, on our website, on the Abaco website. But it, it's an example of MOSA in, in action where by leveraging industry standards, not only the Vita spec, SOSA, Mora, um, that we are able to do rapid technology insertion and take advantage of new technologies as they uh, become available, like AI ML. And who knows what comes in the future? Uh, we have the CHIPS Act with uh, advanced research in silicon technologies. Um, 
MOSA will allow the modular insertion of, of that new technology. So taking that white paper, I want to break this down into a notional uh, block diagram. So essentially, uh, if you look at the three modules on the right-hand side, we have the FPGA uh, with the RF in, out, with multiple sensors. Uh, we have a switch, and then we have the SPC for, uh, for, for the control of, of system control. Um, and so they're connected together uh, using uh, Mora interface and um, uh, the Victory data bus. So the Mora database is the is the dark blue line. Um, sorry, low latency bus is the is the dark blue line, and the uh, Victory data bus is the light blue line. Uh, but they're based on they're using Ethernet physical layer uh, signal protocols. Uh, so that has been deployed, but then we add in the GPU, uh, which is connected to the SBC using using industry standard PCIe, uh, to allow for the addition of AI ML uh, capability. So the fact that we are able to do this in a modularized, standardized format allows us to be able to go and deploy these systems, or at least integrate these systems, much more rapidly uh, using off-the-shelf hardware and COTS. So let me ask you a question. Then is that GPU connected over the expansion plane to that IOSBC that we saw earlier? That is correct. Yes, thanks for bringing that up, Ken. Uh, that is connected through the expansion plane. Um, the GPU is connected through the expansion plane uh, based on the uh, SOSA aligned uh, chassis that we saw earlier. That you right. Presented. So to the audience here, what's interesting about this is we're able to scale this system up and we've got RF elements in it that's got an RF SOC, so an FPGA-based piece of hardware that's sitting on the control and data plane, and it's respecting the ML2B definition. We've got an IOSBC that's got all sorts of nifty features, and it's a multi-core processor. It's quite high-performance processor that's sitting in that slot. And then we have, uh, you know, a by we can have typically in, in these architectures we can have a by four connection and in the compute intensive model we could have a by eight connection so we have this high speed connection what's really interesting to me is that these connections scale in bandwidth as we go up the generation so if we go from gen 3 to gen 4 we increase our bandwidth over the same width of pipe because we've increased from gen 3 to gen 4 so the number of transfers per second go up i think it's like 8 to 16 so then when you're looking at um, that bandwidth, we're doing that on the expansion plane. And then we have speeds and feeds on the control plane and the data plane. On the control plane, we can be looking at 110 or 25 in today's terms. And on the data plane, we can, let's say a few, few months back, we were looking at 40 gig. We can still do that. And that's still good for many things. And then we can also see that data plane communicating or allowing transport of data um, with I and Q samples between the processor, or let's say in this case, the RF SOC, and through the network, through the switch, and then getting it to the resource that's actually gonna consume that data and process it. So this is this is pretty interesting stuff. It shows scalability in a couple of different, different directions as Cards improve, one can go from Gen 3 to Gen 4. You just have to pull it out and plug it in, as long as the backplane's designed at those rates. And in this case, that's the premise. Elman has worked with industry, within the standards, uh, and with our partners to be able to take that backplane and to do testing, interoperability testing, and basically do our jobs as good stewards in the industry and prove that we have interoperability and scalability. And these are two key, two very key tenets of CMOS and MOSA. It, if we look at the top, it's, it's not really captured at the MOSA level, it's captured at the CMOS and SOSA level. But this guides us in sort of the modularity and the scalability, interoperability, and all these good things that we're working to inherently design into our systems so that our users can rapidly reconfigure and advance and you take advantage of this modularity. So I'm pretty excited about what Abaco and Elma has been able to 
work together to do today to be able to talk about something like this, but then to, imp to enter and to add this GPU element into an architecture like this really expands the capability of the architecture. And I, I just think that's really neat. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. So you want to summarize where we're at here then at the end? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in the end, I mean, there's, I think it's pretty clear what the benefits are of, of, of MOSA, um, relying on open standards to develop applications, just, it's just overall benefits for, for, for the program. Um, and there are many vendors out there that are, uh, Abaco, of course, uh, Elma, but there are many vendors that, that are out there that are, that are really behind, uh, MOSA, SOSA, uh, more uh, that that are that are working to develop these up uh, these these modules so that um, um, programs can take advantage of, of of advances in the industry as quickly as possible um, and and essentially time to deployment so and with that it's not just hardware but it's the entire ecosystem right it's the software layers the drivers uh, the test the tool chains the libraries IP blocks. Um, security uh, modules, these are all being developed. And, and what happens is when each uh, vendor has their specialty, they can really uh, deliver the best solution um, for that module that, that, that programs can take advantage of. So we're pleased to be able to speak to everybody today and thank you for your time. But before we go, before well, oh, we go, one last thing. <laughs> Before we go, if anybody is visiting AUSA Global Force, uh, we invite you to come visit our booth. Um, so Abaco will have a booth uh, and we will have an end-to-end -end demo of uh, a MOSA um, technology development platform in action. And Elma will have a development environment that they will be showing. Uh, one of the key things that I want to mention here in the, in our, in the demo uh, that we partnered with Elma is that uh, we have seven different vendors that have contributed to developing this technology demonstration vehicle um, to demonstrate the interoperability and the benefits of MOSA, the modular approach. Um, so um, we have this working demo and we'd love to share this with you and, and answer any questions. So that really looks exciting. And I think that point about seven different companies in the ecosystem coming together to really put together a capability that one would actually be able to see in a modern vehicle today, um, where there's elements, other elements that we didn't get des described because this presentation was around DW, but this is uh, encompassing other facets of uh, technology that are being used in vehicular, vehicular electronics today. And uh, if you come and take a look, you'll, I think you'll discover some really interesting cooperation between the companies that work very hard uh, to get all this capability pulled together. So thank yeah. you, Dinesh. That was a great, uh, a great example of uh, some teamwork that has taken place in industry. It's really great to be a part of it. No, it's been, it's been great to work with them. Uh, and of course with yourself and, uh, and, and your team, uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it really proves the value of, 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 of MOSA and the direction that the industry is headed. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you both uh, Ken and Dinesh uh, for that presentation. Uh, we'll go ahead and move it along to our next speaker, uh, which is uh, uh, John Breitenbach. He is the director of a and Markets at Real-Time Innovations. Um, and he will give his perspective. Uh, so please take it away, John. Okay, thank you. Um, assuming my screen is coming across okay, can somebody confirm that? Yes, you look good. Yeah, okay, see great. It. So um, uh, really appreciate hearing uh, some, some um, conversation there about MOSA, particularly from the, the hardware perspective. We're gonna take a little bit different approach. We're gonna talk about a software perspective on MOSA, particularly for perhaps some larger scale systems. And we're gonna start by taking a look at some examples um, where we are seeing uh, MOSA today 
uh, actually being applied uh, successfully out in the real world. Uh, we'll start with the definition of what an open system is. Uh, we'll talk about MOSA in the news, and then we'll talk about software architecture. In this case, we're going to look at one particular sensor, a radar sensor, and see how we can take a data-centric approach to the software architecture for that to enable uh, and realize our MOSA goals. And then um, we'll have a wrap up and a Q&A. So first, let's start with the definition of open systems. Um, so an open system is hopefully one where everything is defined sufficiently so that we can have multiple organizations working cooperatively on either the same or separate subcomponents in a system. We saw all those hardware black boxes in a ground vehicle. Ideally, we want all the different vendors to be working towards uh, an overall goal of getting them to work cooperatively, but we want them to be able to work in parallel so that we can get better systems designed faster. Um, to do that, we do need a stable set of requirements and that those uh, requirements require stability over a sufficient length of time that we can realize the full development life cycle. And I like the approach that Jason laid out where they're not trying to be overly prescriptive, but they're calling out open standards um, that are approved for use. And of course, when you're using open standards, one of the benefits there is that they are fully documented and open and available to all the interested developers. Um, at RTI, we like to advocate for what we call a data-centric approach. And we think that data, the data in the system is actually the most important part of the system. And it's actually the part of the system that tends to be immutable over time. Um, some of our earlier speakers were talking about the need to upgrade new hardware over time and start adding GPUs. We see all of that hardware stuff and network technology and even programming languages and libraries. That's very high risk. It tends to be very dynamic. It moves all the time. It's, you know, constantly under pressure from Moore's law. The thing that tends to be eternal in these systems is the data model, right? The information that we need to have shared in the system, regardless as, as we upgrade and add to our hardware capabilities, it's that core information that remains unchanged. And so if you use that data model, that information system as your sort of interface between all your different applications, you tend to end up with a very um, nice modular system that can survive all kinds of upgrades uh, over decades. Um, and then, of course, one of the other goals of open systems is that we don't want any of this under the control of any one firm or vendor. We want to break vendor lock-in. So let's take a look at some recent uh, MOSA news stories. Um, so back in December, we saw the first incident of Houthi rebels um, attacking both commercial ships as well as um, some of our military assets. Since that time, it has become an almost daily occurrence. And this is a scorecard that I found in early January. And you can see the number of drones and ballistic and cruise missiles that have been shot down by our various assets over uh, in the Red Sea. All of these ships that you see with DDG in their call out, these are um, destroyers. And these are all running a combat system, a very large scale combat system called Aegis, which ties together our C5 ISR systems, our electronic warfare systems, our radar systems, uh, and a number of other different systems. The Aegis has been designed since it, uh, uh, since it made its transition from analog to digital about 20 years ago. They really took a MOSA approach to the software. And they're starting to realize these benefits now. Admiral Ocano um, said early last year that they didn't really full, uh, fully realize the impact of that transition from analog to digital and turning uh, basically what used to be hardwired connections into messages on a network and information. They didn't understand that, what the benefits would be. They're starting to see that now. These are some uh, recent news stories. On the right, you see uh, an Arleigh Burke uh, uh, Flight 3 destroyer, the Jack Lucas, was re recently updated. Um, they took out the old SPY-1 radar and upgraded it to a SPY-6, uh, the largest member of the SPY-6 family. Um, and on the left, you can see uh, the USS Pinckney recently updated um, just the EW package. They uh, added a system called CWIP Block 3, which brings a lot more EW capability to the existing ship. Now, what's interesting is both of these ships run, you know, common Aegis software, um, and they haven't had to go and do a wholesale upgrade of all the other components in the system to realize this new capability. 
And that is really the most historic, right? We're able to add new sensors, new electronic warfare capabilities without disrupting the rest of the system. We don't have to do it across the entire fleet at once. We can pull in ships when we have access to them and when they're able to be able to do the upgrades. Let's take a little closer look at SPY-6 itself. SPY-6 is a wonderful piece of kit. I really like the approach that the engineers took in designing this system. It is a modular system, both in terms of hardware and in terms of software. So the overall radar arrays are made up of much smaller elements. Those elements are two foot by two foot, what they call RMAs, radar modular assemblies. And the RMAs can be ganged up into different sizes and configurations. In the upper left, you'll see the V1 variant. This is what just went out on the Jack Lucas. And this has 37 of those RMA modules in it. In the upper right, you'll see the V4. This guy has um, 24 for slightly smaller ships. And in the bottom two, you'll see that these are both nine element uh, arrays. Uh, in the case of the, the V2 on the left, it's actually an articulated rotating head, whereas the other ones are all mounted on fixed planes. Um, but what's important here, uh, again, modular approach to the hardware, but from the software perspective, the information coming out of the system is the same, regardless of the size or configuration of uh, the different arrays. And in fact, just as we saw the first uh, SPY-6 V1 go out on the Jack Lucas, uh, just recently a different configuration, the, the V2, which is the nine element on the rotating head, um, just deployed on the USS McCool. Um, which, uh, you know, is an amphibious transport dock ship. Um, so we've seen, you know, this sort of MOSA approach yielding the results where we can put different sizes and configurations of sensors and, and capabilities like EW onto these different vessels. So let's take a deeper dive um, into radar systems and see how we can take a MOSA approach uh, from a software perspective for uh, typical radar systems. And radar systems, I, I, I use the word typical, but there's really no such thing as a typical radar system. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and configurations. We have ones that are mounted on aircraft. We have ones that are mounted on the ground and that rotate. We have ones that go on ships and aircraft uh, in, in jet planes. We have ones that are mounted on trucks that are used by the Army and the Marines for anti-artillery uh, and for missile defense. We have long running systems that are out there for 30 years. We have new technology like the active scanned arrays. So we have this wide variety of different types of radars and entirely different technologies in entirely different domains. So what do these systems have in common? Well, it turns out what's really important for any of these systems is the information that comes out of them, right? And if we take a look at the sort of the hardware commonalities, um, basically we typically have a front end shown by the systems up front or up top. Uh, we have a transmitting system that puts some energy out uh, into the environment. We have a receiving sub subsystem that catches uh, reflected energy, um, perhaps even just passively listens uh, for some other system that's, that's actively transmitting. And then we have a signal processing system that tries to make sense of that. We might tie this into a command and control system. If we're on a moving vehicle, we wanna take those relative um, uh, uh, positions that we detect and we wanna turn those, take our time and position subsystem so that we can turn those into an absolute position. We may wanna store uh, some of this information. We might have a logical tracking system that turns the raw data into tracks that we can do something with and assign names to. Um, and then, of course, we need a user interface. How can we visualize the data and begin to make sense of it? The top half of the screen here, these tend to be what we call the hard real-time systems. These have to keep up with physics speed. They have very demanding hard real-time deadlines, typically in the millisecond and microsecond range. On the bottom side of the screen, we have what we call the soft real-time systems. These are the things that tend to interface with humans, and they interface at human speed, right? Uh, much slower than the hard real-time up top. So back in the analog days, a lot of these systems were connected by discrete point-to-point -point wires. Um, and so if we wanted to layer in our command and control system, it had to have individual connections to all of these other systems. Same thing with our PNT system, right? As soon as we start to plug that in, everybody needs access to that information. Same with our... Um, our tracking system, uh, storage needs to get data from everywhere. 
And then if we want to try and tie into some other cooperating system, an electronic warfare system, something else, where do we begin to plug in? And so like I said, about 20, 25 years ago, the Navy made this transition from analog to digital. And they took this data-centric approach. And what that means is that the data is the most important asset in the system and the applications and sensors and subsystems may come and go. And by taking that approach and putting the data at the center of the system, it actually makes for a nice modular open systems, right? So all of these subsystems can either publish or subscribe to any of the data in the system. And so it becomes very easy to start to layer in new aspects of the system. When we want to add in our command and control system, it brings along the data that it's going to publish. Same thing with our uh, time and position system. Now our PNT data becomes a first class citizen within the network that any other subsystem can use as an asset. Same thing with our tracking system. Now it becomes easy to do something like add a storage system. It can just tap into this DDS data bus and pull out any information it needs. And it also simplifies our connections to other cooperating systems as we look to grow and evolve the system over time. So this in a nutshell is, is the approach that uh, we've seen taken in, in a number of uh, defense systems, um, shipboard and th systems like Aegis, uh, land-based missile defense systems, but we also see it in unmanned maritime autonomy architecture. We see it in avionics. Um, it is a very similar architecture, this data-centric approach. And it is enabled by this technology called DDS, Data Distribution Service, which we'll talk about in a bit. And I will say that this basic pattern scales up very nicely. You can go from an individual vehicle or vessel using a data bus locally within it, and you can start to connect to other systems and other subsystems. And that is true regardless of transports, regardless of the underlying hardware and operating system, regardless of the programming languages in use, they all just work together. And that's um, one of the huge benefits of using this data-centric approach uh, for integrating uh, these various systems. So we get technical interoperability um, for um, you know, both the infrastructure and the protocol on the, the wire level. We get syntactic interoperability, and this is really important. Um, this means that we all agree on what the structure of, for instance, a radar track is or what the structure of our PNT data looks like. And then if we properly model our data, we can actually achieve semantic interoperability. And that means that when you and I are talking about radar tracks, we both agree what altitude means as a, for instance, is it altitude above sea level? Is it altitude above ground level? Two very different things. Um, and so ideally we wanna to get to the level of semantic interoperability. So let's talk about um, open standards, open systems, and how they can enable uh, a MOSA infrastructure. Um, for software, uh, like I said, I, I really liked, you know, some of Jason's message, messages earlier talking about the importance of um, open standards. Um, so DDS is an open standard. It stands for Data Distribution Service. Uh, the DDS standard is owned and stewarded by the Object Management Group. This is the largest software standards consortium in the world. It is a very active and vibrant uh, community of developers that has been working on the standard. Um, for many, many years, it is a growing and uh, evolving standard. It's used in the very latest autonomous vehicles and surgical robots, um, all kinds of cutting edge applications. So it has not stood still. It has been adopting um, to the, the latest demands of distributed systems um, over recent years. And DDS takes a data centric approach. And what that means is that the data is actually the interface between the different applications and systems uh, on the network. So you don't connect to an endpoint, you don't connect to a server, um, you don't open up, you have to worry about connecting to ports or anything like that. Basically, you express an interest in a particular type of data. So, hey, I want track data. And you are then provided that track data from whatever publishers happen to be on the network. So we have anonymous publishers sending data to anonymous subscribers. Um, all the applications are decoupled in time and space and flow. And that's a really important concept in a truly uh, sort of MOSA system. So we end up with reliable data exchange between all these applications in real time, regardless of transport, even in heterogeneous systems. 
Um, the standard is very comprehensive. It calls out a standard wire level API, uh, which gives you cross vendor interoperability. It calls out a standard API, uh, in addition to the wire protocol, the standard API gives you cross vendor portability. Um, and it also calls out an extensive set of what we call quality of service parameters. And the QoS um, parameters are the things that govern the feeds and speeds of data in the system. So for instance, does this track data need to be sent reliably or can I send it best effort? Um, is there a deadline associated with this particular topic? Do I need to get X number of updates per second from my PNT system to maintain course, right? The QoS allows you to tune those kinds of parameters across each individual data flow. And the QoS again are defined as part of the standard. Um, and so they allow you to capture and enforce your system level design requirements, regardless of which vendors and which components you bake into your system. The middleware itself of DDS takes care of all your underlying uh, network transports. It mediates away all of the differences between CPU architectures, networks, operating systems, programming languages. Data arrives in your application as if you sourced it yourself in exactly the format you need it. Um, and by the way, uh, it is TRL-9 technology, um, and it is on the DOD uh, IT standards registry. Because the DDS standard is so comprehensive, again, standardizing API, standardizing wire level protocol, standardizing quality of service, standardizing security model, standardizing an orderly method for data type evolution without breaking backward compatibility, uh, and because it allows you to bring your own data model, you will find DDS under the hood of all of these standards and many more. Um, and you will find standards here across a number of industries. You'll find standards like FACE for avionics, GCIA, GBA, NGBA for ground vehicles, ROS2, Yuma, uh, Caracas, all autonomy platforms for the latest in autonomous systems. Um, SIGI, which is for modeling and simulation. Uh, so DDS is sort of a meta standard. Um, like I said, uh, it is very comprehensive. It's more comprehensive if you're trying to design your own standard uh, for interoperability. I highly recommend you look at DDS uh, because you're probably going to need to set a subset of what DDS brings to the party. Because it is baked into so many standards, DDS really allows you to take a MOSA approach and leverage best of breed. Um, the earlier speakers gave great examples of, hey, we've got, you know, GPU hardware. We want to take advantage of things like AI. Well, the trick is, how do you get these new, each of these columns, vertical columns, is basically a technology stack, a software technology stack that you might use for various parts of your system. So we might be using FACE for our avionics, but we want to leverage in some AI and machine learning. And we got this Python libraries and TensorFlow. Well, how do we get those two things to talk? And then we want to make the system autonomous. So we want to leverage ROS2. Um, and that's going to happen perhaps a different programming language, maybe C++. The Connext data bus, DDS data bus, allows all of these different things to talk together and work together as one. And so this is a great way to innovate, to, redu to reduce risk. You can really pick best of breed technologies while still maintaining interoperability um, with legacy established military standards like FACE, like GBA, and so on. So DDS um, is really a great mediator between both the old as well as the new, the, the very latest scripting technologies, things like Python and AI and machine learning. Um, RTI is a, uh, a commercial vendor of uh, DDS. Ours is called uh, Connects Professional. We don't just sell an implementation. We actually sell a complete ecosystem. We have all kinds of tools and service, uh, services and data modeling. Uh, we have integrations to things like game engines like Unreal and, um, and Unity. Jason earlier mentioned, uh, mentioned the Tesoa ID event. At that event, we were able to show real face avionics uh, talking to simulated um, quadcopters in game engines uh, and tie all those things together. Um, so we do order, offer a complete ecosystem um, of tools and products to go along with that. Uh, I do encourage you to reach out um, uh, to either myself directly or visit our website at rti.com. And with that, I think I'm right at the 20-minute mark. I will stop and turn it back over to our hosts.
All right. Thank you very much for that, uh, John. And uh, that takes us over to our Q&A session. Uh, unfortunately, Ken was not able to stick around for that, but we do have uh, uh, Dinesh and John here ready to uh, answer your questions. Um, so, uh, so we'll get right into them. Um, I will start. Uh, I'll start with you, John. Um, can you talk a little bit about security? Uh, if applications uh, discover each other and share data anonymous, anonymously, how do you uh, secure the system? Yeah, that's an interesting question, right? If, if everybody can discover everybody and see each other's data, that's sort of um, contraindicated to security. Um, but DDS uh, does have part of the standard. There's an entire document just calling out the DDS security specification. And within that specification, uh, the mechanism is basically applications mutually authenticate. One application will authenticate to another. Um, so they exchange security credentials. They have to be tied to a common root of trust, something like a common CA. Um, at that point, assuming that they trust each other, have authenticated each other, they actually share uh, with each other permissions, right? Basically, which topics do I have the ability to read and write? Which ones do you have permissions to read and write? And that is negotiated as well, right? So nobody can write, let's say, the PNT data if they don't have explicit authorization from some certifying authority saying that they can do that. Um, but nobody needs to go back to a central location uh, at runtime to authenticate. All the applications authenticate to each other uh, directly. And then we have the choice um, uh, from a governance perspective for each individual topic, we can choose to fully encrypt it, um, maybe just sign it or leave it out in the open. And, and each of those postures takes a different amount of compute power. So you have the option to turn the knob for each data flow to go between, you know, your needs between confidentiality and performance and find the balance there. So. Gotcha. All right. Uh, so we did have a question for Ken, so I'll go ahead and throw it over to Dinesh. Hopefully he can uh, take that one on. Uh, so the question is, does the expansion plane uh, typically carrying PCI Express still exist in MOSA or is it 100% ethernet connectivity between P PICS? Um, one of the things about MOSA is, uh, at least on the hardware side, we, we tend to use the SOSA aligned um, uh, standard. Um, and so the SOSA, what it does is it defines uh, certain slot profiles, backplane profiles, and um, they do call out the expansion plane and they do um, allow for PCIe over the expansion plane. In fact, the cards that I showed in our presentation uh, the VP431, the SPC3513, uh, we support PCIe uh, out and in on uh, our expansion plane, on the back plane. So, so the answer is yes. Gotcha. All right, well, we are running up on time, but I'm gonna try to get one more question in here for uh, John here. Uh, and that is, uh, is DDS better suited for larger systems or individual sensors and robots? Um, well, it scales really well. You know, if you look at systems standards like Yuma, the unmanned maritime autonomy architecture for the Navy, right? That's designed for small um, unmanned surface vessels and, and unmanned uh, underwater vessels. Uh, and DDS works great there, just in a self-contained uh, small vessel. But as you've seen with larger scale systems like Aegis and, and um, some of our other missile defense systems, it scales up. Um, because you can federate the data that is shared at every single level. And that's one of the advantages of DDS is that it does scale from sensor to cloud. And you only have to learn one technology stack for that whole tree. Normally you'd have to learn, you know, a whole different set of technology for your web applications than for your deeply embedded real time uh, and at every stage in between. But with DDS, it's same technology stack, same data model, top to bottom. Right. Great. Uh, well, thank you both. Uh, that uh, brings us uh, right to our time limit for today. Sorry, we, we could not get to all of your questions today. Uh, someone from uh, uh, someone from us may get back to you after the event with more information. Uh, I would like to thank Ken, uh, Dinesh, and John for speaking today, as well as Elma Electronic, APCO Systems, and Real Time Innovations for sponsoring this session. Uh, this and all open systems media virtual events are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way without the express written consent of open systems media. Uh, this event will be archived online today at the same URL you use to join today's live session, as well as the URL shown at your screen, and will be available for at least one year. 
Uh, please also be sure to attend our next session uh, titled MOSA at the Edge, C5 ISR sensors across multiple domains. And that begins at 1 p.m. EST, so about 12 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.